I'm Kristen Garnell, and I'm a patient of Dr. Carroll's, um, and my life has completely changed. I've been suffering from chronic migraines my whole life. Um, it got to a point where I was bedbound and couldn't handle daily life anymore. Um, turns out I had a spinal fluid leak and never would have known it had Dr. Carroll not figured it out. Oh my gosh, um, a lot of ER visits, a lot of medications. I tried everything, um, Botox, you name it. I was in and out of the ER constantly. Um, and this was the only thing that, just night and day difference. I think the most important thing is to know that when someone has a chronic spinal fluid leak, they do not look like someone who has an acute postural puncture headache. And so Kristen, for instance, um, didn't feel better every time she lay flat. Um, she didn't immediately get worse the minute she was upright. But she had other things in her history that would make you realize she should be worked up for a spinal fluid leak. She had been diagnosed with POT, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, uh, a manifestation of the fact that she did feel worse when she was upright. And um, she was a little bit hyperflexible, uh, indicating that her connective tissue is not quite normal. That actually is telling us something important about the genes that make up her connective tissue. And the, those changes in those genes are critical for the development of a spinal fluid leak. And she had the core symptoms of headache, neck pain, ringing in the ears, chronic nausea, chronic fatigue, and some neurologic weirdness. Numbness in parts of her face that couldn't be explained. Numbness or tingling down an arm or a leg that couldn't be explained. And all of these things fit into a, a story of a chronic spinal fluid leak. Absolutely, lots of imaging. And Kristen, do you remember what what kind of imaging you got and what the imaging found? Um, after the CT myelogram, uh, I don't remember what the, is it the C, CT scan after that. Mm -hmm. um, but no, the, the results came back and they told me I was normal. Yeah. And I was shocked, but we looked again and it looked something that was a little off. So um, we started with an MRI of the brain and full spine with and without contrast that was read as normal. Um, and then she got a CT myelogram of the full spine that was also read as normal. But she had such a good story for a leak, I went back and looked at the CT myelogram with the radiologists. And there were three things on the myelogram where a specific level didn't look like the rest. So there was something called a perineural cyst, which is a dilation of the, the bag of spinal fluid around the nerve root in her sacrum. And um, this is essentially an aneurysm of the thecal sac. And in the same way that a vascular aneurysm can rupture and start to leak, this kind of quote unquote perineural cyst, which is really a thecal sac aneurysm, can rupture. And so we didn't see fluid leaking out of it, but we saw the kind of structure that can leak. And similarly, we saw contrast spreading along the nerve root at approximately T11 um, and also at C7, where we didn't see these things anywhere else. And since she had such a compelling story for a leak, and we could see that there were levels that didn't look like the rest, even though it didn't show a clear-cut spinal fluid leak, we offered her treatment at those levels. Um, well, we went through and decided to do a blood patch. And after that first blood patch, immediately the next day, it was a night and day difference. And that intense pain that was radiating from the center all over my right side, these three big pinpoints were gone overnight. Um, not to say all my symptoms were gone immediately, but that pain that was just so intense was gone. Um, and it was able, I was able to get back to work. I had been on disability for almost six months. 
Um, I got myself back to work. It was about two months that I was okay, and then the headache started to come back slowly. Um, so we decided to go ahead and do a second patch, and again, immediately, so much better. Um, and then I was another month, and I still had a few symptoms. Ringing in the ears was a big one. Um, we did the third patch. I immediately went into high pressure, and um, within two weeks, my level of headache is completely gone and has been ever since. First, let me tell you, when she talked about going into high pressure, there's a condition when people have been leaking for a long time and you suddenly patch them uh, where they can get something called rebound intracranial hypertension, which is a temporary and generally benign increase in pressure in the spinal fluid. We think this is related to people having uh, a upregulation of spinal fluid production in response to their leak. They're trying to keep up with the leak. And when you suddenly stop the leak, it takes a while for your brain to catch up with that and not make so much spinal fluid. And that's, that's what happened to her after that, uh, that final successful third blood patch. Um, and I think it lasted a couple of weeks. Yeah, within, within a week and a half, I was already, like that was dissipating and I was feeling good. Treatment really falls along several lines. Uh, conservative treatment involves having patients typically lie flat for a week or two, uh, increase um, uh, salt and fluid intake, and some people, not everyone and not even a majority, but some people will clearly seal on their own. And uh, even in Kristen's history, there was a period of time when she was uh, in college where she was well for a couple of years. Yeah. Uh, largely well, and we think that she had sealed during that time and then started to re-leak. Um, so conservative treatment works for some people. Uh, if that fails, an epidural blood patch is preferred treatment. Um, at this point, it's not known how many patches people need, and it's not known does the patch have to be done at the site of the leak. At Stanford, we're treating people at the site of the leak, and we find that to be more successful, but this isn't yet proven by, uh, by randomized controlled studies. Um, the other thing for primary care doctors to know is that if a doctor makes a pinhole in the bag of fluid and creates a headache called a postural puncture headache, we know that epidural blood patches work 90% of the time on the first patch. If someone has a spontaneous leak, it's not just a pinhole, it's usually a tear in the dura, and that's a little harder to patch. So the first patch fixes people with a spinal fluid leak only 30% of the time. And with repeated patching, the literature suggests we can get that number up to somewhere between two-thirds and three-quarters of people, with the remaining one-third to one-quarter of people ultimately requiring surgery. But with a spontaneous spinal fluid leak like Kristen's, the rule is you should expect you're gonna to have to patch them more than once, and you should expect that you may need to patch them at the site of the leak, which means having a practitioner who's confident and uh, trained to do an epidural blood patch in the thoracic spine, as in Kristen's case, and in the cervical spine, as in Kristen's case. And so it's not enough to do one epidural lumbar blood patch. You really have to be willing to chase it a little harder and a little further. I mean, it's just the fact that I had gone to the ER multiple times and I had the pre pre uh, sorry, previous diagnosis of postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome and I had identified with that and every time I went in for another headache, we, the doctor just said, oh, it's because you have POTS and we stopped looking for what else it could be. So it just, we needed to see that it was something in addition, and now most of my POT symptoms are gone. The last thing I would add is Kristen wasn't found because finally some doctor thought, hmm, I wonder if she's got a spinal fluid leak. Kristen was found because we became convinced that some people who had leaks might be getting misdiagnosed as having POTS and we called over to the POTS clinic and said, hey, the next time you see someone with POTS, with bad headaches, and especially if they have Ehlers-Danlos, send their names over to us, 
And Kristen, as it turned out, was the first name they sent to us. And uh, I called her on a Saturday afternoon while I was watching my kids in the park and said, hey, you know, I know this sounds crazy, but maybe you've got this thing that we could actually fix. Why don't you come in and see us in the pain clinic? 